um, to be to be very simple and start from the obvious, starting from things we know instead of you know ungrounded abstract speculation. We know that there is a very material object in the universe. We call it a brain. Uh, it has color, it has texture, it has weight. You can squeeze it, it's squishy, you know, it feels like a wet sponge, it's warm, and surgeons can cut it, can slice it, can cauterize it. Uh, presumably, you can smell it, you can lick it and, and taste it. It's a very concrete material object you can hold in your hands, and surgeons actually do that while the brain is alive and working. So it's made of atoms and force fields, the same atoms and force fields that make up the rest of the universe. Uh, in principle, from a perceptual perspective, there's nothing really special about it. It's an object like any other, except that it has highly complex structure. Now, we know that, quote, behind that object, in some way associated with that object, very tightly associated with that object, there is the whole conscious inner life of a human being with love affairs, with heartbreaks, with great adventures, with great disappointments, with enormous pain and suffering, with exhilarating experiences, orgasms, in, in a, a, the entire inner life of a conscious human being. Uh, 80 years of it. It's in some way associated with that object. It lies behind that object in some way, very tightly associated. If you start poking around with that object, something happens to your conscious inner mm -hmm. life, right? So this is a given of nature. And to me, what nature is telling us, uh, if I try to be completely unprejudiced philosophically, and I just extrapolate slightly from the given, what nature is giving me, the way I would interpret it is the following. What we call matter is what conscious inner life looks like from the outside. And that's all there is to it. There is nothing more to what we call matter than what conscious inner life looks like from the outside. That's all. My conscious inner life looks like, from your perspective, a functioning nervous system, a brain. Well, it's more than a brain. I would extend that to the whole body. I started with the brain because it's, such, it's, it's so easy to talk about it. Uh, but I think my metabolizing body is simply what my conscious inner life looks like from the, the perspective of other people. And even from my own perspective, I, if I look down uh, to my body. Um, if that's what matter is, then the whole inanimate universe should be what universal inner life looks like. Hmm. And actually, there is circumstantial evidence about that because the superstructure of... Uh, galaxy clusters and the way black matter congregates in filaments and all that, if you do a, a, a topological analysis of that, it's uncanny how similar it is uh, uh, to, to a nervous system, to a biological brain, uh, so to say. There are at least two studies now done, one in Europe, one in the US, uh, th that show this. Um, so to me, that's what matter is. It's the extrinsic appearance of conscious inner life. It can happen at small scale like you and me or any conscious living any living being even an amoeba or, or a tree a plant um, and then there is the giant scale the inanimate universe as a whole which i think is the extrinsic appearance of universal conscious inner life and i think you and i and every living being is just a dissociated personality of that universal consciousness so to say uh, you alluded to dissociative identity disorder in which a person has these dissociated alters, you know, separate centers of self-awareness that identify with themselves and, and not with the other alters, even though they're all part of the same person. They, they go by different names, they recall different aspects of their respective life histories and so on. Uh, and I think Universal consciousness suffers, and I'm speaking metaphorically here, suffers from a form of dissociative identity disorder. And we, every living being, are its alters, its dissociated personalities. And it mm. is dissociation that creates this boundary, this dissociative boundary, and creates then uh, the extrinsic appearance of conscious inner life. That, that's why 
uh, I perceive your conscious inner life as your physical body, as opposed to gaining direct introspective access to your thoughts and emotions. I don't have direct mm. introspective access to your thoughts and emotions because there is a dissociative boundary between us, actually two, mm. yours and mine. So mm -hmm. through those dissociative boundaries, I have only an indirect access to your conscious inner life. And it appears to me as matter, the matter that composes your body. And because there is also a dissociative boundary between me and the inanimate universe, namely my skin, my sense organs, the boundaries of my body, uh, I also perceive the inner life of universal consciousness uh, in the form of matter, because that's what matter is. It's how conscious inner life looks like from across a dissociative boundary. So mm. having given this intro, and now it's very short, I think life is a dissociative process in universal consciousness. And abiogenesis, uh, the creation of life from inanimate matter, uh, would give us insight into how dissociation first happens. It maintains itself through biological reproduction, but now it's easy. So you're already dissociated, so you maintain itself. But how does it happen for the first time? Presumably, it's much more difficult. Um, and abiogenesis would give us insight into that. So that's mm. how I see. That's how I look upon what you're doing. But yeah, there's lots of philosophical uh, inferences built into my story, which clearly you, you don't want to commit to. You want to stay uh, neutral from this, which may be wise. Well, you know, one, one tried and true method for all of this is thought experiments because in some ways it projects our consciousness somewhere else and asks the field to help us. So one of the thought experiences one can do and you could do is, is with the background on what a cycling little hot spring pool would look like in those periods, the contents of that pool and the self-assembly processes that are going on, you can actually run thought experiments in those little gels and you can actually uh, ask for help to see the complexities of, of function come in and watch the, the community function boot up and then follow pathways along as though you were there, as though you were the creator, right? And in some sense, uh, you know, in, in, in Wheeler's approach or one of these other, maybe the fact that we are imagining such a thing is actually the thing that made it happen. You know, that would be yeah. a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> we are our own creators. But regardless, uh, what's beautiful about that is you're now placing your mind, your imagination at the very boundary between physics and this thing that's emerging from physics that is very different than physics, that accelerates complexity and creativity really rapidly. Uh, somebody called it at another meeting a year ago, a new Copernican revolution. Because then I, in the audience, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you, you're providing the center. This is why in the sand talk, I brought Copernicus' picture in there. And this thing that can create out of the background through cycling and cross these chasms is a, is a kind of new center for everything. So it, it, it may be a center for philosophical questions, certainly for biological questions, chemical questions. But just your imagination reaching into that pool and flowing with what is going on, you create an embodied connection to that, which I think for me, you know, when I do this every day, it's creating a, in a sense, a totality, a, a feeling of, of totality that my mind is now back there, kind of even like hoping and dreaming that they make it. You know, because, but there's a, there's a connection beyond, beyond, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like one of the most powerful spiritual connections I've ever had. Reaching down into that first chakra, chakra that the bottom base, and tying into it, and dreaming and hoping for it, and watching the process, watching the failures, watching the coming into existence and the falling back over and over and over again, pushing against the barrier, and feeling in union with that, creates this kind of molecular union all the way up. But it's my consciousness that is touching those first molecules as they come into a system that can self-organize. And, and it's, there's something there. There's, there's something really juicy and powerful and 
crazy there. You know. I will add something. I, I love the thought experiment. Uh, clearly, you get drawn into it, uh, and I think I would too. Um, I, I'll add something to it, if I may. Maybe it's nonsense, but it's how I, I, I think about it. I, imagine that you are looking at somebody's functional brain scan, and you see all those networks of neurons firing, sometimes together, sometimes out of sync. You know, this is this electrical pulses going around, forming uh, cycles. Um, that corresponds to something that feels like something from the inside, right? Uh, maybe you're having a thought, you're constructing a thought, and it appears in the functional brain scan as patterns of neuronal firings. But the two things are qualitatively very different. Uh, the way a thought feels to me is very different than the way uh, patterns of neuronal firings feel to the neuroscientist looking at the brain scanner. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That they are two views of the same thing. They are not distinct. They You're are right. Camera right. angles to the exact same thing. It's just that they appear differently from different points of view. They look like different things from different points of view, but they have one root, one thing. Uh, so, in my imagination, that primordial foam, the progenotes, uh, and all the chemical exchanges happening through those permeable membranes, the cycles of wetting and drying. Uh, to me, that's the image on the brain scanner, the, f the neuronal firings. It's mm -hmm. the extrinsic appearance. What I would then do in my thought experiment is to imagine how it feels from the other side. Mm -hmm. What mental processes are going on that appear to me as the progenotes? What mental processes are ephemeral? They rise and fall and disappear, just to rise again and disappear, until they become self-sustaining. In other words, until they reproduce and and, and oh. go on. Right. You know what right. I mean? What thoughts are in the mind of universal consciousness that rise as sparkles and then pff, burn themselves out and goes back to nothing until they pff, sparkle again? But then those sparkles start to acquire a certain pattern that start to cycle and become self-sustaining and they, now they maintain themselves and now they mm. can grow. Uh, a loop is closed somewhere that allows them to self-perpetuate. That's a beautiful, that, Bernardo is a very beautifully uh, felt conception. That, that would be my imagination. And yeah. if, if I can add my own conceptual biases and prejudices to, to my pure imagination, I would also imagine this self-sustained thought processes or emotional processes, whatever, uh, uh, whose extrinsic appearance is the, 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 the rise of life, I would imagine them as dissociative processes as well. In other words, there is some kind of felt separation, some kind of gained sense of self-identity as opposed to the rest. A, a, a micro-self is formed in respect to the cosmic self.